So today we're going to be moving from the violently identity threatening weird stories of Robert W. Chambers and Arthur Machen to um, the more conventionally fantastic stories of the Anglo-Irish writer Lord Dunsany. Um, Dunsany has a background that is in some ways rather similar to Wilde's. But Wilde comes, they're both Anglo-Irish, right? That is, they're both Irishmen um, of English descent. Um, so the same could be applied to um, Bram Stoker, who we're looking at next time, uh, or to uh, Sheridan Le Fanu. So <clears throat> Dunsany, unlike these others, uh, who came from sort of the professional classes, um, is a bona fide aristocrat. And his, arist his aristocratic background uh, really kind of informs the worldview of his stories, um, which tend to be, as you've probably noticed, probably closer in spirit to Wilde's fairy tales than to anything we saw in Chambers or Machen. But we're looking at Dunsany in part because he's an enormous influence on H.P. Lovecraft, who we'll be looking at in about a week or so. And because um, the way he exoticizes his particular character, uh, his characters and the you know, various settings in his work um, sort of help us to further construct this kind of discourse of Orientalism that runs through uh, much of what we call the weird. All right, so a little bit about Dunsany's work. Right here he is holding a dog. So Dunsany lived a long life and a very productive one as a writer. He wrote plays, he wrote autobiographies, he wrote novels, he wrote short stories, he wrote poetry. Um, but his career as a fantasist only lasts about 20 years. By the mid-1920s, he's largely gotten out of the fantasy literature game. Um, his first important work of fantasy is called The Gods of Pagana. And what The Gods of Pagana sets up um, is a sort of secondary world that has some correlation with the world that we know in a sort of distant past, but is really a sort of self-contained uh, self world, self-contained universe. And he tells stories of the various deities that the people of this you know, land called Pagana worship. Now most of these deities are petty, cruel, spiteful, and ultimately in a lot of ways powerless. Right? The god who created the universe um, is eternally sleeping. And one of the other most important gods is a sort of celestial drummer who sort of constantly pounds a gentle beat to keep this sleeping god dreaming. So the world is a kind of dream of a sleeping god. So this gets at two things here, right? One, Dunsany's attitude towards gods and religion, a little bit more on that in a moment, and also the dream atmosphere that pervades much of his fiction. Um, his last and probably best work of fantasy um, is The King of Elfland's Daughter, uh, which is particularly concerned with the boundaries between the worlds of magic and fairy and our own everyday real world, right? Now, set back in a sort of faux medieval past, but if you read The King of Elfland's Daughter, you'll probably see a lot of discourses in that that are really quite similar to things that Wilde is dealing with in The Fisherman and His Soul. Now, as far as Dunsany's core beliefs are concerned, we can probably get some sense of the kind of person he was, he was and the sorts of things he believed by looking at him dressed up here for fox hunting, right? We all know what sorts of people defend fox hunting. So the first is conservatism. Now, 
Dun Saney's conservatism is not conservatism as a contemporary American audience would recognize it. It's not about uh, limited governments or economic or religious conservatism. In fact, you know, religious issues don't enter into it really at all, except for um, a kind of cultural attachment to the trappings of the Church of England. Um, what we mean usually when we talk about late 19th, early 20th century British conservatism um, is respect for and defense of the traditional privileges of the landed aristocracy. So it does coincide with modern American conservatism in that both are largely concerned with the defense of private property. But um, Dunsany's brand of conservatism um, had relatively little, little to do with the idea of free markets or deregulation of markets. Um, it had relatively little to do um, with privileging any particular religion over others, except, of course, the establishment of the Church of England. Again, largely for cultural reasons. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, this is a traditional aristocratic conservatism. In the same period, free market fundamentalism, as we would recognize it in today's, say, uh, Republican Party, uh, was primarily the province of what was called the Liberal Party. Um, and the Liberal Party sort of ceased to be a really powerful force in British politics, it's sort of like around the, around the time of the Depression. Um, and their place in the sort of two major party system in British Parliament was taken over by the, the then new Labour Party. The Liberal Party still exists, they're called the Liberal Democrats, um, but with the exception of sort of a few years ago when neither the Conservatives nor, the, nor Labor managed to get a clear majority, and so the Lib Dems attached themselves to the Conservatives uh, to form a government, um, they haven't really been a major factor uh, for about, for almost a century. So that's what kind of conservatism we're talking about when we're talking about Dunsey's aristocratic conservatism, preservation of aristocratic privilege. He is also, probably unsurprising, uh, unsurprisingly, um, an avid imperialist. So at the time Dunsany was writing, the British Empire had really kind of already peaked, right? It had already reached um, its greatest point of size um, and productivity economically. And from that point on, it was really sort of just a slow decline until the various colonies uh, pulled away. Now, <clears throat> Dunsany was an unapologetic imperialist. Most 19th century defenders of imperialism did so on some sort of moral grounds. They argued, for example, that they were bringing civilization to benighted places of the world, never mind that many of these benighted places already had uh, civilizations of their own that were hundreds of years old, uh, thousands of years old in some cases, um, but I digress, um, or that they were bringing the light of Christianity into dark places of the world, um, which, you know, again, replacement of <coughs> the native religion, native belief system with your own. Um, Dunsany defended imperialism on the grounds that it made economic sense for Britain. He didn't get into any sort of fuzzy, moralistic, feelings-based defenses. He acknowledged the brutality of the system, but believed in the superiority of British civilization and believed in the economic benefits that colonization in India and Africa, the Caribbean, brought to the British public. Right? Cheaper goods, more access to exotic goods. People of modest means could afford things through imperialism that they could not afford 
um, without the empire. So <clears throat> he is at least an honest imperialist. We'll give him that. And Dunsany is an agnostic, or at the very, or perhaps an atheist. We're going to hedge our bets and call him an agnostic. He certainly was not religious. And much of his writing indicates that he's really not much concerned with whether or not there is a god. In fact, the gods in most of his works, most of his fantasy works anyway, tend to be um, petty and powerless, as we said. Right? We'll explore that a little bit more deeply in a moment. But these are the major beliefs that animate his writing. All right, so let's talk about a few common tropes that we see running through much of his work. Right, first, we already talked a little bit about the relative impotence of the gods. Right, if we look at the story, uh, the injudicious prayers of Pombo the idolater, for example, what we note in this tale is the almost complete indifference of the gods to human needs. Right? The gods don't care what Pombo wants. The gods don't care what Pombo needs. We'll get to why in a minute. If we look at the very beginning of the story, Pombo the idolater had prayed to Amu as a simple prayer, a necessary prayer, such as even an idol of ivory could very easily grant, and Amuz has not immediately granted it. Pombo had therefore prayed to Tharma for the overthrow of Amuz, an idol friendly to Tharma, and in doing this offended against the etiquette of the gods. Tharma refused to grant the little prayer. Pombo prayed frantically to all the gods of idolatry, for though it was a simple matter, yet it was very necessary to a man. And gods that were older than Amuz rejected the prayers of Pombo, and even gods that were younger and therefore of greater repute. He prayed to them one by one, and they all refused to hear him. Nor at first did he think at all of the subtle, divine etiquette against which he had offended. It occurred to him all at once, as he prayed to his fiftieth idol, a little green jade god whom the Chinese know, that all the idols were in league against him. So. The text constantly alludes to some sort of secret of the gods that Pombo does not know or does not understand, right? That he is not simply not aware of divine etiquette, and that it is bad taste to go and make the same request of multiple idols. At least that seems to be the conclusion that Pombo comes to when the gods refuse to answer his necessary prayer. I think we get a better sense of why the gods don't answer his prayer um, when we look a little bit further at Pombo's encounter with the arch idolater. Right? Pombo the iconoclast immediately left his house, leaving his idols to be swept away with the dust and so to mingle with man, and went to an arch idolater of repute who carved idols out of rare stones and put his case before him. The arch idolater who made idols of his own rebuked Pombo in the name of man for having broken his idols, for hath not man made them, the arch idolater said. And concerning the idols themselves, he spoke long and learnedly, explaining divine etiquette and how Pombo had offended and how no idol in the world would listen to Pombo's prayer. So, what Pombo doesn't understand, but the, the arch idolater does, is that idols are made by human beings, right? They're the creations of human hands. This is why they don't answer your prayers. This is the real secret of divine etiquette. The idols don't do anything because they're artificial. They're just objects made of jade or ivory or bronze. Right? And note here as well, um, 
that Dunsany keeps resorting to exotic materials, right? Things that are difficult to come by in Britain as the materials out of which the various idols are made. Now, we see, I think, a similar discourse in the tale Chubu and Shemish, right, which concerns this dis a dispute between a new idol and an old. So if we look on page 49 in our text here, it was the custom on Tuesdays in the temple of Chubu for the priests to enter at evening and chant, there is none but Chubu. And all the people rejoiced and cried out, there is none but Chubu, and honey was offered to Chubu, and maize and fat. Thus was he magnified. Chudu was an idol of some antiquity, as may be seen from the color of the wood. He had been carved out of mahogany, and after he was carved, he had been polished. Then they had set him up on the diorite pedestal with the brazier in front of it for burning spices and the flat gold pl plates for fat. Thus they worshipped Chubu. So Chubu is... He seems to have some rudimentary sentience, but he is primarily a physical object, right? The making of the idol, the setting up of the idol is here described. And then the people decide to worship this thing that they've set up. We know how old Chubu is, right? We know how old the idol is, right? By looking at how aged the wood appears to be. He must have been there for over a hundred years when one day the priests came in with another idol into the temple of Chubu and set it up on a pedestal near Chubu's and sang, There is also Shemesh. And all the people rejoiced and cried out, There is also Shemesh. Shemesh was palpably a modern idol. And although the wood was stained with a dark red dye, you could see that he had only just been carved. And honey was offered to Shemesh as well as Chubu, and also maize and fat. So it seems at some point that the people who worship in this temple have decided to set up another god, another carved object alongside Chubu and worship them together. And what the people do not understand is that their idols loathe each other, right? They're trying, Chubu was trying very hard to make an earthquake through much of the tale in order to show his anger and to embarrass Shemesh. And Shemesh also wants to make an earthquake in order to prove his power. But neither of them can quite do it. They resort to petty childish insults. And Chubu spake unto Shemesh, as speak the gods, moving no lips, nor yet disturbing the silence, saying, There is dirt upon thy head, O Shemesh. All night long he muttered again, There is dirt upon Shemesh's head. And it was dawn, and voices were heard far off. Chubu became exultant with earth's awakening things, and cried out till the sun was high, Dirt, dirt, dirt upon the head of Shemesh. And at noon he said, So Shemesh would be a god. Thus was Shemesh confounded. And with Tuesday, one came and washed his head with rose water, and he was worshipped again when they sang, There is also Shemesh. And yet was Chubu content, for he said, The head of Shemesh has been defiled, and again, his head was defiled, it is enough. And one evening, lo, there was dirt on the head of Chubu also, and the thing was perceived of Shemesh. And then they resort to just calling back and forth to each other, Dirty Chubu, Dirty Shemesh. Now, once the earthquake actually arrives, it does not do what either god intended, right? Chubu wanted to show his power. Shemesh, or uh, show the displeasure. Shemesh wanted to assert his power. But what it does is topple both idols and break Shemesh. And Chubu thus becomes a colonialist's collectible. That is how Shemesh came into my possession when I traveled once behind the hills of Ting. I found him in the fallen temple of Chubu with his hands and toes sticking up out of the rubbish, lying upon his back, 
And in that attitude, just as I found him, I keep him to this day on my mantelpiece, as he is less liable to be upset that way. Shemus was broken, so I left him where he was. Outside of the context of the culture that made and worships these idols, they have no real meaning, they have no power. They're tourist trinkets. And here we have a representation from a Sydney sign illustration of one of Dunsany's stories of little dark goblins worshiping an idol. Now, another thing you've probably noticed as you look, went through these stories is the number of them that involve thieves and attempts to steal a particular object. But they often tend to sort of cloak the thieving in a sort of polite euphemism. Right, so for example, uh, in the tale that we have illustrated here, it's a little dark, maybe it's hard to see. We have a small man with a sword running away from a giant dark spider thing. The distressing tale of Thangobrind the jeweler, right? Thangobrind's expertise as a jeweler, right? That is, one who steals jewels, not one who cuts and sells gems, is what's important or it's what's referred to anyway uh, in the name. The probable adventure of the three literary men, right? Three thieves who steal the greatest poem ever written, briefly. The loot of Bambasharna, in which a pirate crew steals the Queen of the South and then takes her off to a distant island. Right. The adventures of Sir Alderic and the Horde of the Gibbelins, right? This knight who has girded himself to try to steal the treasures of these kind of dark creatures that live on the very edge of the human world. And how Nuth would have practiced his art upon the knolls. Now the interesting thing about this right, is that Nuth never does get to practice his art upon the knolls because his assistant is killed and apparently eaten before he can do so. So the title is even framed in terms of what would have happened had Nuth been successful. So thieves in these tales are valued for particular kinds of cleverness, right? Particular areas of expertise. Thangobrin, for example, um, is especially clever in covering his tracks, not clever enough to avoid, to avoid the spider idol. And none of these guys actually ever get the promised reward. Right? This ties into another of Dunsany's tropes that we'll talk about in a moment. But I want you to think more, to try to think a little bit more deeply about why so many of these stories involve theft. Right. Stealing from an idol, stealing from something that appears to be a god or godlike. Stealing from monsters that are dimly understood by human beings, right? What sorts of things are these guys trying to steal? And why does it matter that they fail? What does this also tell us then about Dunsany's view of expertise generally? Oh, that's interesting. That didn't work out quite so well. Now, it's also interesting to note how many of Dunsany's stories sort of fudge the boundaries between the real world and a kind of imaginary secondary world, right? Like, for example, this particular illustration is from the pirate story, The Loot of Bambasharna. Um, we have the pirate, the captain of the Desperate Lark here and the Queen of the South, whom he's kidnapped to turn into his bride. And this is a story that begins in the real world, right? Things had grown too hot for Shard, captain of pirates, on all the seas that he knew. The ports of Spain were closed to him. They knew him in San Domingo. Men winked in Syracuse when he went by. The two kings of the Sicilies never smiled in an hour of speaking of him. There were huge rewards for his head in every capital city, 
with pictures of it for identification, and all the pictures were unflattering. Therefore, Captain Shard decided that the time had come to tell his men the secret. Riding off Tenerife one night, he called them all together. And so, all of these are locations in the real world. So Captain Shard escapes his bad reputation by escaping from the world as we know it and going off to a fantasy island where he thinks he can build a new life with his crew. In the injudicious prayers of Pombo the Idolater, right, we see that Pombo is um, Burmese but is living in London. In Miss Cubbage and the Dragon of Romance, right, we have a young English woman take, uh, apparently the daughter of a very important political figure, taken away by a dragon and brought to an island. Right. Little upon her 18th birthday, thought Miss Cubbage, of number 12A, Prince of Wales Square, that before another year had gone its way, she would lose the sight of that unshapely oblong that was so long her home. And had you told her further that within that year, all trace of that so-called square, and of the day when her father was elected by a thumping majority to share in the guidance of the destinies of the empire, should utterly fade from her memory, she would merely have said in that affected voice of hers, go to. A little further down. There sat Miss Cubbage at evening on her balcony, quite alone, waiting for her father to have made a baronet, right? Almost a situation out of a fairy tale, except this is a political coronation rather than um, the more sort of feudal aristocratic fantasy version you get in a fairy tale. She was wearing walking boots and a hat and a low necked evening dress, for a painter was but just now painting her portrait and neither she nor the painter saw anything odd in the strange combination. She did not notice the roar of the dragon's golden scales, nor distinguish above the manifold lights of London the small red glare of his eyes. He suddenly lifted his head, a blaze of gold, over the balcony. He did not appear a yellow dragon then, for his glistening scales reflected the beauty that London puts upon her only at evening and night. She screamed, but to no night, nor knew what night to call on nor guessed were the dragons overthrowers of far romantic days, nor what mightier game they chased, or what wars they waged. Perchance they were busy even then, arming for Armageddon. So she's innocently sitting on her balcony, posing for a portrait, when a dragon shows up and kid kidnaps her, carries her away to a fantasy land. And only once did there ever come to her a message from the world of old that she knew. It came in a pearly ship across the mystical sea. It was from an old school friend that she had had in Putney. Merely a note, no more, in a little neat round hand. It said, it is not proper for you to be there alone. It is not proper for a young, for a young woman to be by herself in such a place, unsupervised unchaperoned. So Miss Cubbage's escape from the dreary realities of being a member of a political family is intruded upon by this kind of dreary Victorian Edwardian morality. Right? It is not proper for a young woman to be unchaperoned. This speaks to another of Dunsany's important tropes. You may have noticed that relatively few of these stories end um, unambiguously happily. Right? There's always some kind of ironic twist that, you know, that if it doesn't rob victory outright from the hero, at the very least it destroys their satisfaction. One example being the Horde of the Gibbelins, right? Halderick is not getting that treasure. So the distressing tale of Thangabrin the jeweler, the probable adventure of the three literary men, in Pombo the idolater, in the loot of Bambasharna, the quest of the queen's tears, and how Nuthwood of practices are upon the knolls. Right? We have, in each of these cases, fruitless or defeated quests. 
Let's look at the quest of the queen's tears in particular, because this is especially interesting. Right? The hero, in order to get the queen, right, Sylvia, queen of the woods, to weep, has decided, okay, if we can't make her te cry tears of sadness, we can get her to cry tears of joy. So he goes to kill the gladsome beast. It seems a horrible thing to do, right? I will kill the gladsome beast that dances happily on the edge of the world. Steals its tears and brings them back for Sylvia to drink, hoping to inspire tears of joy in her. And Akronian sang as he never sang before, and will not sing again. Oh, but dolorous, dolorous are the ways of man. Few and fierce are his days, and the end trouble and vain, vain his endeavor. And woman, who shall tell of it? Her doom is written with man's by listless, careless gods, with their faces to other spheres. Somewhat thus he began, and then inspiration seized him. And all the trouble and the beauty of his song may not be set down by me. There was much gladness in it and all mingled with grief. It was like the way of man. It was like our destiny. Sobs arose at his song. Sighs came back along echoes. Seneschals, soldiers, sobbed, and the clear cry made the maidens. Like rain, the tears came down from gallery to gallery. All around the queen of the woods was a storm of sobbing and sorrow. But no, she would not weep. Everything that Akronion has done has been for nothing. He's undertaken this great quest, gone to all this trouble, put himself at personal risk, composed the greatest song any man will ever sing, and nothing. He cannot move the queen to tears. And I think what a lot of these tales have in common are efforts by human beings to control events and phenomena that they have no reason to be able to expect to control. Right? They're going up against shadowy monsters or natural forces that they cannot change, that they cannot alter through mere talent or force of will. Captain Shard cannot make the Queen of the South love him. Pombo the Idolater cannot make idols of wood, stone, and metal answer his prayers. The three literary men cannot steal the greatest poetry ever written from the mind of its writer and bring it back to the world of human beings. However good they are, they can't force their will upon that which will not be moved. Now, this is probably a good place as well to review um, our discussion of Orientalism and to maybe take it a little bit further and a little bit deeper um, because this is one of the tools that Dunsany uses to give his tales an air of the exotic and it's very much tied in with his own um, imperialist beliefs. So Orientalism, as I believe we've said before, is a term used to describe Western imaginative depictions of and scholarship on Initially, mostly the Middle East and India, but um, it's also used um, to talk about East Asia and sometimes um, even parts of Africa. And what an Orientalist usually does is present the Orient, right, that is the East, as exotic, languid, decadent, and kind of backwards, right? If it is civilized, it's presented as over-civilized to the point of decadence. 
Um, Edward Said, um, who probably coined the modern scholarly usage of the term, um, wrote in his book, Orientalism, that it is a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient, right? So essentially it's about the West defining the terms in which the East is to be discussed. Defining what the East looks like, what it means to be Oriental as opposed to Occidental. So, to give you an example, this is a French painting from the late 19th century by Jean-Léon Giron. It's called Harem Pool. Now, what we have here are two apparently white women in various states of undress, sort of lying about languidly in a clearly Middle Eastern style atmosphere. We've got the ornate rug, we've got the little uh, sort of gazebo-y thing up here. I'm not ex entirely sure what to call this. Um, it's a, an entirely female community with the possible exception of this. I can't see the slaves' features well enough. Um, to determine gender, but this is clearly a slave and because one, only person fully clothed here, and two, offering to these women a pair of hookah pipes. Right, so we have an air here of kind of drug-induced indolence, as well as a kind of racial hierarchy. Now we will talk a little bit in more, a little bit more detail about racial hierarchies when we talk about um, the Lair of the White Worms, or as these were imagined in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. But we see here that the black figure in the painting is clearly meant to be subservient to the white Oriental figures who would themselves, were there a white Western figure in the painting, be regarded as subservient to that figure. As it is, the fact that you're sort of lounging around doing nothing and smoking lends an air of decadence to the whole proceeding, right? The tendency was to view the entire East as one of these sort of pits of decadence. Now, Irish Orientalism has a history of its own. Now, much like India, parts of Africa, Australia, the Caribbean, Ireland was a British colony. In fact, some would argue it is, was the first nation that the British colonized. And so there was a tendency among Irish scholars and thinkers to define their own identities against those of the English, right? To embrace the kinds of Oriental stereotypes that the English often foisted on Indians, Arabs, Africans, and so on and so forth, right? So to recap a little bit, right, the Englishman would regard himself as hardworking, temperate, and chaste, and practical. He would then regard the Oriental as lazy, drunken, promiscuous and imaginative, right? Dreamy. So <clears throat> some Irish scholars and artists go so far as to invent oriental origin tales for themselves, right? That in fact, the Irish came from somewhere out of the East originally. That rather than being closely related to the Saxon, the Celt, is in fact some sort of Oriental, right? This arises in the medieval period in particular. 
Now, Celticism and Orientalism, that is, the academic study of the Celts, of Celtic cultures and of the Orient, arise together in a sort of parallel stream in the 19th century. And there's a great deal of similarity between the two. By, in both cases, it's mostly outsiders defining what it means to be Oriental or what it means to be Celtic. And there's a great deal of overlap between the two, as I pointed out a moment ago. So, Ireland, in that it was an island, you know, an island nation inhabited by white people, had a sort of strange liminal position within the British Empire, right? It's a colony, but it's a white colony. So, Ireland wasn't quite on the periphery of the British Empire, like most places outside of sort of the metropolitan center of Britain would be. Due to its physical proximity to the metropolis and the ethnic and racial similarity between the Irish and their English colonizers, it occupies a kind of strange in-between place. So I want you to think about the ways in which Dunsany is using these particular Orientalist tropes, right? writing as an Anglo-Irishman, someone who himself has a foot in both worlds, right? the world of England and the world of Ireland. Um, and what he means by bringing these, Oriental, these Orientalist tropes into these particular stories. Now, these issues of race, ethnicity, and nationality are going to become especially important next time when we talk about Bram Stoker's uh, Lair of the White Worm. And I'm going to be honest, um, I had forgotten before I assigned, yeah, before I assigned this um, just how virulently racist this book is. Um, we will definitely talk about that uh, next time. I think it's something that we really need to address. Um, but I want you to think about also the following as you read. First, what is the white worm that's mentioned in the title? What's its nature? What's its history? What does it have to do with other figures in the plot? Now, as we talk about the sort of discourse of race um, and ethnicity in the weird generally, think about the narrative purpose that Edgar Caswell's African servant, Belonga, serves, um, and to the extent to which he's part of a discourse of foreignness or of inherited characteristics um, in the novel. Third, um, you're going you're gonna to be reading a lot of characters discoursing at length on the history of the part of England in which the story takes place. What's the point of all this? Why so much focus on regional history? And so what that one of the novel's heroes, actually a couple of the novel's heroes, have these antiquarian interests? And this is a confusing, jumbled mess of a novel. And it's not always going to be clear to you it's going to be clear to you who's, who's good and who's bad. But it's not always going to be clear to you who the primary antagonist is. So I want you to think about who you regard as the primary antagonist in the novel and why. All right, so that's it for Lord Dunsany. We'll talk about Bram Stoker next time, remaining firmly rooted in Anglo-Ireland.